Good morning, everyone. Okay, uh, today's scripture reading comes from Deuteronomy, chapter 18, verses 9 through 14. When you enter the land which the Lord your God is giving you, you shall not learn to imitate the detestable things of those nations. There shall not be found among you anyone who makes his son or his daughter pass through the fire, one who uses divination or soothsayer, who interprets omens or a sorcerer, or one who casts a spell or a medium or a medium or a spirit, or one who consults the dead. For whoever does these things is detestable to the Lord, and because of these detestable things, the Lord your God is going to drive them out before you. You are to be blameless before the Lord your God. For those na for these nations which are you you are going to dispose, listen to soothsayers and diviners, but as of you the Lord your God has not allowed you to do so. Thrice the branded cat hath mewed, thrice and once the hedge pig whined. Harpier cries, tis time, tis time. Round about the cauldron go, in the poisoned entrails throw, toad that under cold stone days and nights has thirty-one sweltered venom sleeping got, boiled out first in the charmed pot. Double, double, toil and trouble, fire, burn, and cauldron bubble. Filet of finny snake in the cauldron boil and bake. Eye of newt and toe of frog, wool of bat and tongue of dog. Adder's fork and blind worm's sting, lizard's leg and owlet's wing. For our charm of powerful trouble, like a hell broth boil and bubble. Double, double, toil and trouble, fire, burn, and cauldron bubble. Scale of dragon, tooth of wolf, witcher's mummy, mull, and gulf. Of the raven, salt sea shark, rot, root of hemlock, digged in the dark. Liver of blaspheming Jew, gall of goat, and slips of yew, silvered in the moon's eclipse, nose of Turk, and Tartar's lips. Finger of birth strangled babe, ditch delivered by a drab. Make the gruel thick and slab, add thereto a tiger's children for the ingredients of our cauldron. Double, double, toil and trouble, fire, burn, and cauldron bubble. Cool it with a baboon's blood, then the charm is firm and good. Yeah, it's Halloween in it. It's October. Dark forces are amassing. Actually, it's happening all year long. But the thing is, is that we think about this stuff this time of year because of all the things that are going on, you know, Halloween and all that. And as we mentioned earlier, the Rio Grande Valley is actually one of those places in which witchcraft, sorcery, fortune telling, and whatnot, it, it, it continues. It continues. And, um, and it's important to discuss these things because it's everywhere. You know, all this stuff that's on this slide from your Ouija boards to your black magic books to your tarot cards, it can be bought and started. You can get these in Barnes and Noble. In fact, you know, the Ouija board, and I was looking, doing some research on this, they actually have a little girl's addiction. It's bubblegum pink and sky blue. You can get it at Target. It's out there for the world to have. And what we have to recognize is the darkness that is entailed in all of this stuff. And what it can do to us. Because it's, you know, because it's, it's kind of like uh, what C.S. Lewis said at the beginning of the screw tape letters. You know, there's, he writes in, in, the, in the prologue that there's, there's two attitudes that people usually have about the devils. 
And it says some people do not believe in their existence at all. And some people believe in them too much. The devil, he's happy with them both. And it's the same thing with witchcraft and sorcery and all these kinds of things. Either some people don't believe them at all, or people believe in them too much. And again, the devil and danger lies in both. Because as was just read by Rick, you know, the Bible does talk about fortune tellers, sorcery, necromancy, and all these other types of things. But, you know, it's an interesting little thing. The Bible never said witchcraft and mediums were not real, but repeatedly taught to have nothing to do with it. And there is a key difference. We could sit back in our 2021 American mindset and just say, oh, it's not real. It doesn't exist. There's no danger to it. Blah, 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 blah. I would suggest to you, talk to some missionaries. Talk to some people who have been around other parts of the country, other parts of the world. And ask them what they've seen and experienced when it comes in terms of this type of spiritual warfare versus witchcraft. They got some stories. And they, they can tell you times in which local witches, local sorcerers, have even tried to put the kibosh on them, so to speak, through various ways. Oh, yes, it's out there. Yes, people use it. Yes, people practice it. Yes, people believe in it. But also what we got to ask ourselves and what we have to remember is why, you know, why wouldn't God want us to practice this stuff? And the answer is, it's dangerous. It's dangerous. There's dangers to all of it. And that's what we're going to talk about today. The, danger, the first danger is a danger of misplaced devotion. Now, you know, again, when it comes to, to fortune telling, witchcraft, and things like this, you know, again, you know, the, the Old Testament tells us to, you know, you, don't, you shouldn't let uh, these people live, have nothing to do with it. And I didn't want to go to Bible verses like that because, again, it's, I have teenagers, and, and what I've learned about having teenagers and knowing other people's children is like sometimes the worst thing you can tell a teenager is not to do something. And uh, let's face it, adults, when we were once kids, what was one of the worst things that somebody could have told us? Now, don't you do that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that, yeah, that worked on us too, didn't it? Yeah. Okay, so let's look past that and look at the dangers. And we're going to look at some other, uh, what some other verses besides just the have nothing to do with it. Let, let's look at what else was, was going on. In Leviticus chapter 20, and look at verses 6 through 8. It says this. It says, If a person turns to mediums and necromancers, whoring after them, I will set my face against that person and will cut him off from among his people. Consecrate yourselves, therefore, and be holy, for I am the Lord your God. Now, in this, he has an interesting expression. In the, in the English Standard Version, he calls it whoring after. You're whoring after this stuff. Well, it's like, well, what does, what, what does that mean? You know Basically, what God's telling them is don't play the prostitute to these people. And so, well, that's harsh language. Yeah, it's harsh language. It's strong language. But it's getting to the point. What happens, and this, and this is true of all sin, but we're just right now we're talking about, you know, the, this witchcraft and sorcery stuff. But the truth of the matter is that's what all sin wants. That's what the goal of all sin is, to get us to a point in our sin journey where we just are quite happy to sell ourselves to whatever it is that we want. We don't own it. We don't control it. If we're trying to pursue witch, witchcraft, sorcery, and whatnot, we don't control it. It controls us. Because we are selling ourselves to it. We are being bought by it to where it will control us and it will control how we think it will control how we dress it will control how we act 
It will control how we interact with other people. It will also control what we believe and also what we don't believe. It will take hold of us and own us. Where what does the Bible say? The Bible teaches we were already bought for a price. We belong to God. But if we pursue the dark arts of this world, we will soon belong to them. And we can't be owned by both. So it's a misplaced devotion. It's wise to be devoted to something that actually cares about us. This dark art stuff, it is incapable of love. It's not just that it doesn't love us. God is love. God is love. That's his essence. It's in his DNA. If God is love, that means the things of this world or anything that is not God, that is not centered on godly virtue and godly righteousness. It's not that it doesn't have the ability. It's, it's not just that it doesn't love you. It can't. Because it's not in its makeup. The forces of evil are incapable of love. There is no love in Satan. There is no love. And yet, when we get bogged down into this dark arts of the world, we are devoting ourselves to something that is incapable of love. Instead, be devoted to the one who is very nature is love. And you say, well, well, why are we talking about this? Maybe you're sitting there thinking, why are we still talking about this? It's because this is what the devotion has come to. Not only have we are we talking about psychics and stuff, but now these days you do some Google searches, you try to find a psychic in your area. Not only are they psychics, they're also psychic life coaches. And something that I've, I've never been able to understand is, it's like, well, if they're truly psychic, why do I need to call them to make an appointment? But you see the, the, the twist that's going here. People would call a psychic and they or people would call these people and they would look for guidance and career and in love and, and all this. And so again, the word psychic wasn't enough, so now they want to become a life coach. Well, what is a life coach? Life coach is like a, a new term for the motivational speaker. It's it's somebody that you can hire or you can bring into your life and they will direct you how to live your life. I already got that. His name is God. Maybe you've heard of him. But that's the thing is, it doesn't just stop with a dabble. What starts with a dabble, what starts as a kid's game, what starts as something seemingly harmless can blossom into something that truly takes hold of the entire life. You know, for, you know drug, drug use is a good example. You know, anybody who starts dabbling with drugs, have you ever heard, or maybe you've experienced this, I know there's people here who've, who've either fought those battles or drugged themselves, or they have people in their family that, that have. When, when somebody that you know and love, or maybe when you self took that journey, when, when you started dabbling with drugs, did, did, have you ever heard anybody say to themselves, man, I cannot wait until I've lost everything, I'm homeless, I'm in an alley, freebasing heroin with a cigarette lighter and a spoon. No. It was innocent fun. It was innocent fun. It was an innocent risk. But it exploded into a very massive problem that took hold of the entire life. And we become devoted to this thing which now seeks to destroy us. This is the pursuit of witchcraft and sorcery. Again, it's labeled as kids' games. In the end, it will seek to take over our entire lives. But that's only one danger. There's others. Danger number two is misplaced faith. A misplaced faith. Flip over to Isaiah chapter 8. Isaiah chapter 8.
Isaiah chapter 8 and verse 16. Look, listen to what's being said here. Okay, it says, Bind up the testimony, seal the teaching among my disciples. I will wait for the Lord, who is hiding his face from the house of Jacob, and I will hope in him. Behold, I and the children whom the Lord has given me are signs and portents in Israel from the Lord of hosts who dwells on Mount Zion. And when they say to you, Inquire of the mediums and necromancer who chirp and mutter, should not a people inquire of their God? Watch this now. Should they inquire of the dead on behalf of the living? To the teaching and to the testimony, if they will not speak according to this word, it is because they have no dawn. They will pass through the land greatly distressed and hungry, and when they are hungry they will be enraged and will speak contemptuously against their king and their God and turn their faces upward. And they will look to the earth, but behold, through stress and darkness, the gloom of anguish, and they will be thrust into the thick darkness. There's a misplaced faith. There's an interesting phrase here, and I love that. It was, uh, it was verse 20. No, it was verse 19. Where, where the question is asked, should they inquire of the dead on behalf of the living to the teachings and to the testimony? Well, in other words, when we get together with the witchcraft and with the soothsayers, with the mediums and the spiritualists and, and all this, there's, that the thrust is to use otherworldly powers in order to have an influence on the world with which we live. Or sometimes it's, I want to communicate with somebody who has passed on so that the person who has passed on can tell me what the land of the dead is like. Or they can give me directions of what I need to do for life. I need to ask great-grandma so-and-so the direction I need to go for my life because she is dead. And since she is dead, she has a higher wisdom than I do. And so she can tell me what it is that I need to do. Why in the world am I going to inquire of somebody who is already dead about what I need to do since I'm still alive. What sense does this make? But this, again, is what it is. Seeking to go to other places of power when God is sitting here on the other side whistling to us. I can't do that strong. I can't do that. But saying, hey, I'm over here. Ask me. What sense does this make? But it's a misplaced faith. People feel like they can't go to God, or God can't be trusted, or God has no idea what he is talking about. So I'll go to the medium. I'll go to the sorcerer. I'll go to the medium so that I can contact the dead. I'll go to the sorcerer so they can give me a potion in order to have an, an influence on my life. I'll go, to, I'll go to my grandparents so they can rub an egg all over my body and tell me why I'm sick. Uh-oh. Whoops. Did that, did that just come out? Did he just do that? Oh, is that, see, it's, it seems so innocent. But all the while, we're putting our faith into this. Do we really feel like that the, um, the positions of the stars has a bearing on what kind of personality we're going to have? Yet we'll go and read our horoscope and we'll have that dictated to us and they'll say, this is what you are. When over there, God is saying, I can tell you what you are. I can guide you. I can direct you. I can tell you what you need to know. Don't go to them. Come to me. But we won't go to him if we don't have faith in him. We'll stay away from him and think, there's nothing he can do for me. Better to use these. Harry Houdini. There's an interesting aspect to Harry Houdini's life. And it's also a literary uh, irony. Sherlock Holmes was created by a British author named Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. 
And Sherlock Holmes is, uh, you know, surely everybody's heard of him, very analytic, very logical, you know, follows the evidence and, and just, you know, very, very cerebral in everything that he does. But Sir Arthur Conan Doyle himself uh, was a believer, was a very staunch believer in the supernatural, uh, was a staunch follower of spiritualism, uh, in whom his wife practiced. Now, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, the reason I bring him up was Sir Arthur Conan Doyle was actually also one of the best friends of Harry Houdini. And Harry Houdini was devoted to his mother. And she passed on. And Sir Arthur Conan Doyle's wife said, well, I can contact her for you. So they have seance. And uh, Mrs. Doyle writes, you know, they, they called it ghost writing back in the day, but basically she's writing a letter, and, and the theory is, is this letter I write is actually from your departed loved one. And she handed this letter, it's like, your mother wanted you to have this message. And he says, well, wait a minute. My mother was a foreigner. She spoke two languages. I think it was German and Yiddish. The Yiddish, I'm sure of, if it wasn't German, it was some other European dialect. But she spoke two languages, and neither one of them was English. <laughs> Whoops. And so that started this, this uh, campaign, this mission that Houdini had towards the end of his life and the end of his career, in which he devoted himself to the exposure, the exposure of charlatans, the exposures of these false fortune tellers and whatnot, because the tricks that they were using around the table Guess what? Were tricks that Harry Houdini himself would use on the stage. And so he knew the tricks and he knew how people could fake holding on to hands and being able to have stuff on them which they could slip away, but the person next to him still believes that they're holding hands so that they could stand away from the table and blow the ghost trumpets and, and wiggle the table and everything else that was going on. He was able to single them out because it, it, it annoyed him, it hurt him that there was a class of people out there that would take advantage of the grieving. In fact, he actually said this. He said, I have spent a goodly part of my life in study and research. During the last 30 years, I have read every single piece of literature on the subject of spiritualism that I could. I have accumulated one of the largest libraries in the world on psychic phenomenon, spiritualism, magic, witchcraft, demonology, evil spirits, etc. Some of the material going back as far as 1489. And I doubt if anyone in the world has so complete a library on modern spiritualism, but nothing I have ever read concerning the so-called spiritualistic phenomenon has impressed me as being genuine. It is true that some of the things I read seemed mystifying, but I question if they would be that were they to be reproduced under different circumstances, under test conditions, and before expert mystifiers and open-minded committees. Mine has not been an investigation of a few days or weeks or months, but one that has extended over 30 years, and in that 30 years I have not found one incident that savored of the genuine. If there had been any real unalloyed demonstration to work on, one that did not reek of fraud, one that could not be reproduced by earthly powers, then there would be something for a foundation. But up to the present time, everything that I have investigated has been the result of deluded brains or those which were too actively and intensely willing to believe. And in fact, after Harry Houdini died, he actually set up a, a, a situation with his wife that they actually had a seance on Harry Houdini's birthday in which they would get together people and have a seance and see if somebody could reach Harry Houdini beyond the grave. Before Harry Houdini died, he gave his wife a specific word. And it says, if they can come back to you with this word, then that means that they contacted me. And it never happened up to the point in which his wife died. So again, it's, it's, it's a false faith. It's a, it's a misplaced faith. On these things because again even if people are talking to the dead the dead still don't know as much as God does and we as Roy was talking about earlier with prayer we have a phone line directly to the Almighty so why in the world am I going to try to communicate with those who have gone on before me because they're still dead humans I want to talk to the one who knows it all and can direct me to everything that I need to know 
He's the one that I should trust. He's the one that I'm going to have faith in. All this stuff is cheap imitation. It's also the third danger is that the power is destructive. The power is destructive. And, and you can, you know, we're not going to look at 1 Kings 18 28. We looked at that a couple of weeks ago when we were studying Elijah. But, but the, the 1 Kings 18 28, what that tells us is, is while the prophets of Baal are trying to communicate with Baal in order to have fire come down from heaven, it got to the point where they started taking out their knives and start cutting themselves and bleeding, bleeding themselves in order to get the attention of, of their God. And also, but if you do want to flip over to uh, 2 Chronicles, 2 Chronicles, chapter 16, verse 33, 2 Chronicles, you get a list of some sins by a guy by the name of Manasseh. In, verse, in chapter 33, verse 6, it says, And he burned his sons as an offering in the valley of the son of Hemnon, and used fortune-telling and omens and sorcery, and dealt with mediums and necromancers. He did much evil in the sight of the Lord, provoking him to, deign, to anger. You know, basically, it's a complete reverse of what Rick read earlier that Israel was not supposed to do. And now we have the king of Israel doing all of it and more. But in order to get the attention of the soothsayers, in order to get the attention of the necromancers, in order to get the attentions of the gods, he had to kill his own children, sacrifice his own children to this stuff. And isn't it interesting when we're talking about black magic and, and forces like this, that the power is destructive. The power is destructive. It's not beneficial, it's destructive. There are still places in the world today that you do not dare let your children go out around Halloween time. Because your children will be kidnapped and sacrificed to some dark deity for the sake of someone else to get power. When I was growing up in southeast Dallas, we were, you know, it was a known thing. When you get close to Halloween time, you do not leave your animals out. Because your animals will be stolen and they will be sacrificed for some dark purpose. They had to put guards in the city of Dallas. They would put guards around some cemeteries in various parts of town. Why? Because people would go in there, desecrate graves, steal bones, steal skulls, whatever else they could do, in order to use it for dark purposes. The powers of darkness are destructive. Always. Always. It has a veneer of innocence. It has a veneer of games. But in the end, there's going to be a cost. There have been times in, in working down here, people have called me, can you come and pray for my house? Can you come and pray for our family? We feel like there's something dark on the loose. And guess what's usually, you know, more times than not, the vast majority of times than not, and I think those other times they just, they don't remember what specifically there was, there's always been a trigger. There's always been a trigger. You know, I asked one family, it's like, well, when did this stuff start? Well, we brought in a Ouija board, and then I was like, oh, just, you know, I almost did the curling. <laughs> You know, and just stop it. It's like, that's all I need to know. I mean, it's, it's like we welcome this stuff in and we think this stuff's going to be innocent. It's not innocent. It's destructive. And it's going to lead us down a path of destruction where it's going to cause harm to everything that we touch. It's a self. We do it to ourselves. It's not someone else doing it to us. We're doing it to ourselves. And again, that's the danger of it all. The last danger we're going to talk about today is that showmanship does not equal strength. Showmanship does not equal strength. You know, when, when you go to a fortune teller, you go to a soothsayer, you go to a sorcerer, they, they make a big business on the show. You know, the fort you go to the fortune teller. They're, they're wiggling the table. They're doing all the special effects in order to get your attention, in order to make you believe that it's real. You go to a uh, sorcerer. They make a business of mixing the potions and doing all this and, and getting into your life to figure out uh, what it is that you want done to somebody else. I saw a video. I wasn't able to post it on the, from the site that I saw it from. But about three years ago, an anthropology professor from the University of Brownsville, is that the southernmost university? That's what they call it. Uh, goes out to this uh, cemetery close to the border 
And they discover this, this offering that had several statues of the Grim Reaper tied to a spell, tied to a picture of a woman that somebody put together so that they could bring death to whoever this woman was. But it's all about the show. It's about the spectacle. It's about making it look impressive. But the thing is, is that we're shown again and again and again that the showmanship does not equal strength. For example, in the book of Acts chapter 8, Verse 9 through 13, you get the story of Simon the sorcerer, who before Philip got to the area was viewed to be as a very big deal. He had the entire area of Samaria. That was like, oh, oh, he's somebody special. You know, they even called him, this man is the power of the God that is called great. But then Philip showed up and started showing real power. The power of the Lord. And you look at what happens. In verse 9 it says, But there was a man named Simon who had pre previously practiced magic in the city and amazed the people of Samaria, saying that he himself was somebody great. They all paid attention to him from the least to the greatest, saying, This man is the power of the God that is called great. And they paid attention to him because for a long time he had amazed them with his magic. But when they called, believed Philip as he preached good news about the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. Even Simon himself believed, and after being baptized, he continued with Philip. And seeing signs and great miracles performed, he was amazed. The, the sorcerer, the magician, was amazed at the miracles that were being done because he recognized real power. He knew he had some sort of power, but it wasn't real power because real power overshadows false power, mediocre power, time and time and time again. You flip over to Acts chapter 19, you get the account of Paul as he goes to Ephesus. And Ephesus was a wonderful mission ground. It was a very fertile mission ground for the Apostle Paul. And you get this and you get the result in verses 19 and 20 of the wonderful things that are happening. And it says in verse 19, And the number of those who had practiced magic arts brought their books together and burned them in the sight of all. And they counted the value of them and found it came to 50,000 pieces of silver. So the word of the Lord continued to increase and, increase and prevail mightily. Why would they do that? Why would they do that? They had magic. They had sorcery. They had magic books that valued up into the thousands of the pieces of silver. Why would they give it all up? Because all the magic they had, all the sorcery they had, all the false teaching they had, it paled in comparison to the almighty power of God. But do we believe that? Showmanship is, is uh, interesting. Now, if you're looking at this picture and you're asking yourself, is that really a World War II picture of four people carrying a tank? The answer would be yes. Now, you might ask yourself, how are they able to do that? And it's an easy answer. The tank's not real. The tank's not real. In World War II, the spy game was important and it was huge. And what uh, the British forces started doing was, was that they, had, they, they created these false tanks that could be filled with air and they used them for, for practice situations but then someone came up with the bright idea of why don't we distribute these across various battlefronts so that we can give the enemy the idea we're setting up our army here instead of over here they used it as misdirection and so literally you could take four people and carry a tank because the tank wasn't real the tank was nowhere near as impressive as a real tank. Again, fortune telling, magic, all this kind of stuff. There might be, people might get off on some sort of powerful high that they're able to do something. But the reality is, is that power, none of that power is anything in comparison to the power of God. You know, I didn't show you the verse, but this is another reason why we have those verses in the New Testament in which uh, Jesus tells his followers, it's like, you know what? You're going to be able to stand on scorpions. You're going to be able to stand on, on snakes. You're going to be able to drink poison and, and not die and all these other types of things. Why? Because as the gospel went out amongst the world, there were times in which the forces of darkness tried to malign themselves against the followers of God. And they would try to poison the messengers of God. And they tried to put spells against the messengers of God. 
of God. They tried to kill the messengers of God through various ways. And God kept them living. Why? For the sake of them? No. So that other people could learn the true power of God in comparison to the lesser power of the forces of evil. The devil cannot stand before God and never could. Athanasius, who lived 296 to 373, he put it this way. He says, Yet man, despising this, fall into idolatry, leaving the unseen God for magic and astrology. And all this is in spite of God's manifold revelation to himself. And that's really the linchpin to this whole thing. It's like, why pursue magic? Why pursue sorcery? Why pursue fortune telling? Why pursue all of this? It goes back to idolatry. And what are we worshiping? Ourselves. I don't want to rely on God's power. I want to rely on mine. I don't want to go to God for guidance. I want to create my own guidance. I don't want God to heal me. I want to rely on some spell that I'm able to enchant or potion to be able to mix in order to do it myself. It all goes back to the problem of myself. I don't want God's power. I want power. But you know what? This is when the followers of God, we stand up and we say, you know what, it might sometimes take a long time to wait on God. But, you know, I want to, as we sang earlier, I want to be still and know that God is God. Amen. I want God to guide me. I want God to direct me. I want God to heal me. I want God to watch over me. I want God to lead out my steps because his power is good, his, powerful, his power is more powerful, and his ways are right. Amen. All these other things... It's quick fixes, duct tape fix. It's, it's illusion. Even in those instances in which they're real, it's, it's not nearly as good as what we could have. So as we enter the season in which this stuff is going to be talked about and in which this stuff is being sold into stores and all that, remember what this is. Because, again, you know what? This stuff is in, it's, it's in our schools. Our children are having to, to deal with these things still today. It hasn't gone away. Are we prepared with the knowledge that the power of God is more powerful than anything, anything that we come across in this world? And to sacrifice ourselves to these powers that are not that impressive is to sacrifice ourselves and put us into a dark place that we do not need to be. And it will do nothing except destroy us. Watch yourselves. Watch your children. Watch your grandchildren. And have nothing to do with it. Amen. This morning we'd like to offer the invitation to those of you who might be hurting, who might be suffering. Maybe you've been wrapped up in, in this type of dark stuff. And, you know, and, and if you have, you might have heard the... Uh, a lie, you know, we got you now, there's nothing you can do about it. It's a lie. Paul's journey to Ephesus proved that. An entire city turned away from it. People can turn away from it. It might take some work. It might take some tears. But it's possible. There is no trap or pit deep dark enough that God cannot get us out of it. Amen. The one who puts us into those deep dark pits are ourselves. If we want out we need to humble ourselves before God so that he can raise us up. Maybe you're here this morning and you don't know how. We would love to talk with you. We would love to pray with you. We would love to guide you. We would love to walk with you. Maybe you do know. Maybe, maybe you know about baptism. You know about walking with the Lord. You know about the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross and, and his willingness to die for all of our sins. But, you know, but then we have to ask ourselves, have we then made the choice in which to give ourselves to the Lord? But whatever need you have, would you please come down as we stand and as we sing?